they met in a, in a tavern. She loved it. She loved him unabashedly. His relationship with Elizabeth seemed to work wonders for him. But underneath, he was seething and plotting revenge. If you really have a very negative core in yourself, there's this kind of envy, a need to destroy the beauty in others. And the first one on his list was Stephanie Brooks. He was secretly still talking to Stephanie, hoping to make her fall in love with him again in order to hurt her just as she had scarred him. To enhance his image, he became active in local politics, working on the governor's re-election campaign. I thought he was very smart, good at politics. He was good at what he did. He, he was friendly. In 1971, at the age of 25, Bundy was working in his spare time at the Seattle Crisis Center, manning the suicide hotline phones. Beside him worked soon-to-be author Ann Rule. He was kind. He was uh, very good on the phone. And ironically, we saved lives together. Now, at that point, if anybody had told me that there was anything underneath this perfect surface, I would have said, you're crazy. Because we were locked up all alone together in a four-story Victorian mansion that looked like nothing so much as the house in Psycho. Um, but I felt safe locked inside with Ted Bundy. By 1972, Ted's first real girlfriend, Stephanie, still inhabited his thoughts and his plans. On a business trip to San Francisco, he met with her, and the new Ted Bundy swept her off her feet. And she fell madly in love with him and agreed to marry him. As soon as she agreed to marry him, he dumped her. Two days later, on January 4th, 1974, Ted Bundy began a five-year rampage of killing that would horrify the nation. Most of his 35 victims had one thing in common. His ideal victim was a small framed female, long hair, part of the middle, style of person, usually pretty good looking. They all resembled Stephanie Brooks. On January 4th, 1974, just days after severing his relationship with Stephanie Brooks, Ted Bundy began his reign of terror. Over the next six months, eight women disappeared from college campuses in Washington, Oregon, and Utah. I think he was looking for victims 24 hours a day. There were people that he specifically was scoping out, acting like a predator towards, and then there were those that were just happened to be at the right place at the right time for him. His first two victims were students at the University of Washington. People like to believe that it was someone from outside. There must be some depraved killer out there in the community who is coming to the campus. Little did we know that the killer was one of us. Even his girlfriend, Elizabeth Kendall, had no idea who Ted really was. From February through June 1st, Carol Valenzuela Nancy Wilcox, Donna Manson, Susan Rancourt, Brenda Ball, and Roberta Parks all vanished. Nobody had connected any of these cases together. Different police jurisdictions, different states. This was a terrible mystery. I mean, who, how could these girls suddenly just disappear? One little girl was walking like 30 feet from the back of her sorority to another sorority, and boom, she's gone. How could this happen? Her name was George Ann Hawkins. Years later, after his capture, Bundy divulged the perverse methods he used to stalk and capture so many of his victims. He preyed upon their kindness by pretending to be injured. The girls he picked were all helping kinds of people. Here's this guy on crutches often, limping along, dropping his books, and he would ask young women, well, could you help me get these, these to my car? That was the ruse he used on George Ann Hawkins. As she bent over to put his books into his car, Bundy grabbed a tire iron he had hidden. 
He hit her over the head and pushed her into the car. He would secure their hands in some fashion, either with handcuffs, strips of sheet, or leather. His seat was missing, so they could lay down in there and no one would ever see him. Bundy usually drove his victims into the deep woods surrounding Seattle. If they survived his attack with the crowbar, he would sexually assault them. From his point of view, the thing that would make for good sex is an attractive woman whom he's going to handcuff, terrorize, and make her believe that she's going to die. Later on death row, he was asked what it was like to murder someone. And he answered, murder is not about lust and it's not about violence, it's about possession. When you feel the last breath of life coming out of the woman, you look into her eyes, at that point, it's being God. After he was through, he would discard them deep in the forest, but he would return later. He was going back over and over and over again to crime scenes. Not to just destroy evidence or anything, but to do things with those bodies. We suspected he took a whole body home with him because we had one victim that was totally made up with stuff that she never wore. Bundy's use of makeup is simply to make a victim more attractive, but apparently he didn't require it. He went back to decomposed corpses and still had sex with them. To the psychiatric experts who studied him, Bundy was unique, straddling two different categories of serial killers. He is both a sexually sadistic serial killer, he's also a necrophilic serial killer. The common characteristics are perversion, lack of conscience, and a willingness to sacrifice others' lives for one's own sexual pleasure. There's not a lot more to it than that. After at least eight murders, Ted Bundy was becoming an expert at killing. In July of 1974, his addiction led him to take two women in one day. A beautiful Sunday afternoon. It was 90 degrees in Seattle, and we don't get that many 90-degree days. Everybody was at Lake Sammamish State Park. One of those was Janice Ott. She was lying on the beach when Ted approached her. He had his arm in a sling. He asked if she could help him tie his boat to his car. When she got up to go with him, she stuck out her hand like she was going to shake hands, and she said, hi, I'm Jan, and he said, oh, I'm Ted. Janice walked away with Ted and was never seen alive again. An hour later, Ted was back at the park. There were at least four to five other women who were approached between, say, 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 4.30. But something about Bundy must have put them off. Denise Nasland wasn't as lucky. At about 5 p.m., she walked to the restroom at the lake. She was there with her boyfriend, her dog, another couple. She left with the dog to go to the bathroom. The dog came back, but she didn't. After the disappearance of Ott and Nasland, witnesses who had met with the mysterious Ted at Lake Sammamish that afternoon came forward. A composite sketch of the man was circulated. The police received 3,500 tips and compiled a list of potential suspects named Ted. Bundy's name was among them. The name Ted was brought up. I never made the connect at all. You only met the monster through his acts. Between 1973 and 1974, the monster had been working for the King County Law and Justice Planning Office, where he was preparing a study on rapists and their victims. He was also secretly studying the procedures the police were using to try and catch him. By October 1974, five more bodies had been found, but most of them had decomposed or were just scattered bones. Bundy had left no clues, and he was long gone. Two months earlier, he had been accepted to the Utah University School of Law, but he could not stop himself from killing. <laughs>